sits one of the most unique museums in the world. It houses one of the most diverse and fascinating collections of medical exhibits ever assembled. A showcase of medical history at the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, these exhibits represent true landmarks in medical science. And it is these stories we will explore at the Muto Museum. The Mutter Museum, to the untrained eye, has the appearance of a house of horrors, a bizarre and macabre place. But this is not the case. Its whole purpose is to teach physicians to save life. Many diseases represented in the collection are simply not visible to the 21st century American. What you see here are advanced stages of untreated diseases they may still be common in other parts of the world that don't have the benefits of Western medicine, but uh, they are not seen on the streets or the trolley cars as they would have been a century ago. When the College of Physicians was established in 1787 in the city of Philadelphia, the science of medicine and America itself were both in their infancy. At Independence Hall, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams and others convened to write a new constitution for the United States. Only a few blocks away, Dr. Benjamin Rush, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, organized a group of leading physicians to become the founding fathers of a new medical society, dedicated to the advancement of medical science. For thousands of years, medicine was a hit or miss proposition confined to mystical treatments, folk cures, and educated guesswork, the healing arts lacked a rational or systematic approach. This was a time when patients told doctors what to prescribe, when examinations of the body were considered inappropriate, a time before a knowledge of microbes or of anesthetics, when bleedings were a treatment for disease, and one in five women died in childbirth. The College of Physicians would be dedicated to changing that world, providing scientific study rooms, professional meeting halls, and a medical library. And in 1849, the college established a museum, which would become the Mutter Museum, a storehouse of exhibits specifically created for doctors and medical students a living catalog of the unique ailments that plagued human health, and a showcase of the many medical conditions that modern medicine would have to confront. Symbolized by Esculapius, the Greek god of health, the Mutter Museum would become a center for medical education. Gretchen Worden, curator and director of the museum, has been here for 26 years. The college is the oldest private medical society which is in continuous existence in the United States. The Mutter Museum began in 1849, really, uh, as a small collection of specimens which one of the fellows of the college, Dr. Isaac Parrish, has suggested be organized here. And it really became the Mutter Museum, though, when Dr. Thomas Dent Mutter, who is professor of surgery at Jefferson Medical College, offered his teaching collection to incorporate the earlier small collection and become known as the Mutter Museum. The Mutter was originally known as the Museum of Pathological Anatomy and was created to promote science to professionals and the public. To enter the museum is to take a fantastic voyage into the history of human health. For nearly two centuries, the Mutter has been a center of learning and a showcase of some of medicine's most historic displays. Some of them are fascinating, and many of them truly rare, but all with the goal of education. Originally, it began to serve medical students, and today we show the general public, as well as the profession, the history of the profession. 
and we show them how medicine has changed uh, over the past 150, 200 years. In 1856, Dr. Mutter donated over 2,000 specimens, along with $30,000, to maintain and enlarge the facility. A new building was constructed, and in 1908, yet another home was built to house the ever-increasing collections. A landmark date for the Mutter was 1874, when anatomist Dr. Joseph Hirtel of Vienna sold the museum his personal collection of 139 human skulls acquired in 22 countries. Most of them, like these gypsy skulls, are from Eastern Europe and are a study in particular ethnic types. The exhibit is fascinating, but not unique. What makes the Mutter collection different is its purpose, to inspire scientific research. Dr. Hirtel's systematic assembly allows medical students the chance to examine the impact of everything from disease to lifestyle on the face and head. Dr. Hirtle was interested in what we now call physical anthropology, in the variations among the facial features of different people depending on their genetic background. Because each skull has a name and the cause of death and the occupation of the individual, which gives you a little sort of peek into the life at that time. At the time, there was a popular belief that head shape was an indicator of intelligence. Studies of these skulls and the lives of their owners helped scientists disprove this idea. Skulls were also of special interest in the 19th century because of the now defunct field of phrenology, the business of determining one's personality based on head shape. Phrenology machines, like this one, were designed to take a set of head measurements that could supposedly discern your personality type. Let's see what this says about you. Uh, you're generally an agreeable person, not a strong art lover, however. Phrenology, as it turned out, was not a valid science. But any history of science is, in part, a history of learning. And phrenology did help lead science to the idea that different parts of the brain have different functions. One of the oldest examples of man's interest in the skull are these replicas that illustrate the ancient practice of trepanning, the medical term for creating a hole in the head. This dangerous practice was performed in cultures throughout the world for thousands of years and for all kinds of reasons. The ancient Egyptians describe the procedure in very great detail. There are medical papyri that date to the 17th, 18th dynasties. In many areas, trepanation seemed to have been done for very rational reasons, to correct a depressed skull fracture, to correct the effects of a concussion or a fall. Uh, some of the trepanations are very large, three, four inches in diameter, so exposing a very large part of the skull and yet they healed, and they healed to an amazing degree. These skulls demonstrate how well they healed and also show a variety of trepanning techniques, including cutting and scraping. These examples are from trepanning procedures that took place in Ecuador and Peru, which were remarkably successful. The Mutter also has a collection of hand-operated trepanning drills used by Western surgeons in the 18th and 19th centuries. They were the best that doctors had at the time, and they were used only for medical purposes. In places like Africa, more primitive forms of trepanning continued into the 20th century. As in ancient times, these operations were steeped in religious significance and ritual. Trepanning is employed today in modern operating rooms whenever brain surgery is done or if an injury requires relieving pressure in the skull. And there is a tiny subculture in the West that also feels trepanning has benefits for perfectly healthy people. One such believer is Amanda Fielding. Amanda holds that trepanning raises human consciousness by causing more blood to rush to the brain producing a kind of third eye effect. She was so convinced of this idea that in 1970, 
she made a film of a trepanation procedure that she performed on herself. She first practiced on a test skull, then cut her hair and used a drill on herself without a general anesthetic. The entire procedure took three hours. Amazingly, the operation didn't slow down Amanda's social schedule. That night, she went out for a steak dinner and then to a party. While she now opposes the idea of self-trepanning, which is potentially deadly, she still claims it can expand human awareness. Most medical experts strongly disagree, which is why displays like these at the Mutter are so important. They document the history of such practices and throw light onto medical realities that extend far beyond the human skull to every organ of the body. This program is brought to you. Be emergency ready. Practice your emergency plan. Have a NOAA All Hazards Emergency Radio at work and home. Call or visit our website today. The Mutter Museum is a citadel ornamented with human remains. A bastion of body parts, important in its time because it cast an unblinking eye on the human condition for the sake of science. The Mutter houses some 20,000 specimens and instruments, representing the evolution of modern medicine and the diversity of medical disciplines. For students of ophthalmology, over 100 wax eyes, created in France and purchased by the museum, peer out across the main hall. They illustrate many conditions of the eye which medical students might never otherwise encounter. Having so many samples in one place provides a unique opportunity to compare variations of disease. The exhibit also includes the brain of Laura Dewey Bridgman. Born in the early 1800s, she was the first blind deaf mute trained to read. A century before Helen Keller, she became such an inspirational figure that little girls would pop the eyes out of their dolls and call them Laura. Of course, the number one treatment for ailing eyesight is spectacles. And there are over 60 early examples in the collection. The first eyeglasses were a single lens, basically a magnifying glass. Later, scissor spectacles aided both eyes and became known as a pair of spectacles. The frames were made of leather, wood, tortoise shell, and metal. These Chinese glasses are the oldest in the museum. Though their precise age isn't known, they may predate any in Europe. Bifocals, of course, were invented by Philadelphia's native son, Ben Franklin. There is also a collection of hearing organs from both humans and animals. Students of comparative anatomy can examine similar structures found in many species, which help to demonstrate the evolution of the ear. The Jackson Collection features over 2,700 objects that have been swallowed or otherwise internalized. And some are pretty remarkable. Large safety pins, nails, food and jewelry, buttons of various kinds, jacks swallowed by children, and even dentures swallowed by adults. The most amazing thing is the fact that people were able to swallow them. And getting all of this out of their system required specialized tools, like this bronchoscope, developed for the delicate task of extracting foreign bodies. The scope was inserted down the throat and a tractor rod was inserted into the scope and guided to the obstruction. At the tip of the tractor were pincers for grabbing items lodged in the throat or a magnetic tip for snagging metallic pieces. Lessons learned from the Mutter displays extend to every discipline. This oversized phantom brain is one of the most prominent exhibits. Created by a Swiss artist in 1884, it illustrates the working systems of the brain, each distinguished by a different color. Meanwhile, real brains have been preserved from victims suffering everything from epilepsy to tumors. 
The collection of brains we have in jars uh, shows a comparative anatomy of the brain. We have human, we have rat, we have cat and dog, and it simply shows the, the various development of certain portions of the brain depending on the animal. In exploring the human brain, cross sections made specifically for the museum by Joseph Tunis in 1911 provide vivid insights into all the components of the human head. Sectional anatomy, as it's called, was of great interest early in the 20th century. It served as the MRI of its time, offering a new view of the body. Indelicate work like this was sometimes done with a brain slicer, a tool still in use today. These head dissections also provided for a new exploration of the internal anatomy of the face. This was of special interest after World War I, when soldiers who were horribly disfigured in battle turned to surgery for a solution. Without a detailed knowledge of the facial structure, gained by exhibits like those at the Mutter, the art of plastic surgery would not be possible. Humans have more facial muscles than any other primate, 44 altogether. This gives us a subtlety of expression unequaled in the animal kingdom. So to make sure a facelift doesn't look like a facelift, an intimate understanding of the muscle system is critical if it's going to produce a happy result. Changing the body for reasons other than medicine has long been part of human culture. But the Mutter's exhibits are not about fashion or appearances. They're about medicine and education, a creative way to use the dead to serve the living. Now, museums are generally places to showcase artifacts that played a role in history. But the Mutter Museum has on display pieces of the history makers themselves. Sometimes, an item has value simply because someone famous once owned it. It's true of houses, cars, clothes, musical instruments, and occasionally, body parts. At the Mutter Museum, major chapters in history are documented by such medical memorabilia. Is there anything more important to a politician than his mouth? Well, in 1893, President Grover Cleveland's mouth was in serious trouble. This tumorous growth was discovered on the roof of his jaw and is now preserved at the Mutter. Initially diagnosed as sarcoma, something had to be done and fast. The timing of this emergency couldn't have been worse. America was in the grip of a financial crisis, the Panic of 1893. That year, several railroads went bankrupt, triggering a wave of falling stocks and bank failures. One of the worst depressions in American history loomed. To head off economic disaster, President Cleveland sought to repeal the Sherman Act, which served the interests of silver barons at the expense of everyone else. But repealing the act would not be easy. Even his vice president, a silver man himself, opposed the repeal. Cleveland would have to go directly to Congress, but he couldn't do it with a cancerous jaw. Furthermore, if news of his illness leaked out, it could generate more panic and shift power to his vice president. So, an operation was done in secret. On the night of June 30th, 1893, the president was snuck aboard the Oneida, a private yacht of a wealthy friend. The next day, the surgery took place as the yacht sailed up Long Island Sound. It was a major bit of surgery. Most of the president's upper jaw, from the first bicuspid to the last molar, was removed. Yet, no visible sign that an operation took place could be allowed. So the surgeon, Dr. William Keene, performed the procedure making no external incisions at all, with the help of this dental mirror and this cheek retractor, which he had bought in Paris years before. Once the jaw was removed, a dentist, Dr. Casson Gibson, was called in to replace it with an artificial jaw made of vulcanized rubber which replaced his palate. Remarkably, after the operation, there was no change in the president's appearance and his speech was unaffected.
Cleveland appeared before a special session of Congress on August 17th and successfully pushed for repeal of the Sherman Act. A national disaster was averted, and the news of the president's cancer remained secret for the next 20 years. Less dramatic than this was the operation on Chief Justice John Marshall in 1831 to remove these stones from his bladder. Marshall became one of the most important of all Supreme Court justices, and he lived years beyond the operation. Equally prominent in his field was the doctor who performed the operation, Dr. Philip Singh Physic, known as the father of American surgery. Removing bladder stones was an area of his expertise. It required an arsenal of specialized tools for extracting mineral buildups in the body, called calculi. And the mutter has a 50-year collection of such specimens that looks almost like a jar full of seashells. Delving into the depths of your basement or the back shelves of your attic can turn up some real surprises. But searching the storerooms of the mutter can unearth incredible finds that you won't see on the Antiques Roadshow. Imagine rummaging through old storage and coming up with a baking powder can containing tissue from the vertebra of John Wilkes Booth, the Confederate sympathizer who assassinated President Lincoln. We have a specimen that it was originally identified as a piece of the thorax of John Wilkes Booth, set up to us by the Surgeon General after the post-mortem examination of Booth in 1865. He and a few conspirators decided to kidnap Lincoln and hold him hostage until the U.S. recognized the Confederacy. But when General Lee surrendered to Grant on April 10th of 1865, Booth's plan changed to murder. Booth shot Lincoln at Ford's Theater in Washington. After firing the gun, he leapt onto the stage and broke his ankle. As the president slumped in the balcony, Booth hobbled outside to a waiting horse and made his escape. Lincoln died in bed the next morning. Booth was pursued for the next 11 days and was finally cornered and shot to death in a tobacco barn in Virginia. The bullet hit the fourth vertebra, shown on this model. They were interested in that area because that's where the bullet went through his neck. It partially paralyzed him, and so he was instantly a quadriplegic and died a few hours later as respiration ceased. An autopsy was performed, and this spinal tissue was removed. As for how it got to the mutter, it was sent there by the Surgeon General after being removed from three of Booth's vertebrae that were kept at the Army Medical Museum, a museum which, in 1867, had moved to the Ford Theater Building, site of the assassination. But the most fascinating historical display at the Mutter may well be the plaster death cast of Chang and Eng Bunker, the original Siamese twins. Born in Bangkok in 1811, they caused a sensation from their first day of life. In their hometown, they were known as the Chinese twins, since they were three quarters Chinese. Chang and Eng were connected at the chest. There was a band of cartilage about five inches long that was between them. It was fairly flexible so they could stand side by side. They shared a liver and they also shared the diaphragm. Chang and Eng were identical twins, meaning they shared all their genes in common. And in fact, all conjoined twins are identical. They put themselves on display to make money, but they refused to live their lives as a freak show. They married and had children, 21 children in all. Their brides were sisters, Sarah Ann and Adelaide Yates, and they set up home on neighboring farms in Mount Airy, North Carolina. Chang and Eng actually had quite different personalities, and it's known that Chang was the more irritable of the two, and he was highly predisposed towards drinking, which his brother was not, and in fact, the two of them ended up having a fist fight over exactly that. Though they consulted doctors about being separated, it was not possible then because they were joined at the liver, which can also be seen at the museum. 
It's a fascinating phenomenon, but it is not well understood. In fact, we don't even know what causes ordinary identical twinning to occur. Chang and Eng's story is medically important because the contrast between their experience and that of normal identical twins provides insight into the origins of personality. The conjoined twins that we've known of so far have very, very different personalities. And I think this is quite surprising to most people because you'd assume that because they share such a common environment, they should really end up being very similar. And of course, they share the genetic backgrounds. But when two people find themselves in such close quarters, there is probably a real pressing need to differentiate and to develop their own identities. Chang died of a cerebral clot in 1874 at the age of 63. Eng died an hour later. Separating conjoined twins has only recently been successful with the help of state-of-the-art technology. And it's the evolution of medical technology that is also preserved at the Mutter. I lost it. Globe Trekker, Venezuela, Monday at 8, only on the Travel Channel. It was in ancient Greece that the internal structures of the body were first explored. But only by examining the hacked up bodies of fallen warriors. Even the inquisitive Greeks refused to defile a corpse. Public displays of the world within us were not pioneered until the 18th century enlightenment. The era of scientific fervor that produced places like the College of Physicians of Philadelphia and its Museum of Anatomy. Around the same time in Paris, a cousin to the Mutter Museum was established by French anatomist Honoré Fragonard. And like the Mutter, it's still a valuable resource for medical students today. Fragonard's methods of dissection and preservation were ahead of their time. And his vivid displays of the human interior scandalized polite society in Europe. Fragonard built an exhibit of informative displays much like those at the Mutter, created more for working professionals than for the general public. His illustrations of rare and incurable diseases throw light onto an era of medicine now largely confined to history. This fetus, nicknamed the mermaid, developed with its legs fused together, a rare mutation of special interest to physicians studying genetic defects. Fragonard pioneered new methods of preservation for his displays. Cadavers were injected with wax or plaster, which preserves the tissues and allows the skin to be peeled back to reveal the internal structures. These techniques and the works they produced symbolized the revolution in anatomy that took place in the 1700s. The College of Physicians of Philadelphia was part of that same revolution. The Mutter Museum collections employed similar techniques to create its displays. And it is the history of these techniques, the changing tools of the trade, that are also part of the museum's story. Deep in the archives is preserved a warehouse of the medical artifacts and technologies of yesteryear. This Assyrian tablet, carved 2,600 years ago, is the world's oldest known prescription, evidence that from the beginning, the medical arts have been a profession. These ancient gynecological tools were unearthed from the Roman city of Pompeii. What's most striking about them is how similar they are to the speculum and other instruments of today. Other antiques include these acupuncture needles, used for a traditional form of Chinese medicine that's undergone a revival in recent decades. Doctors in the 19th century were very well acquainted with acupuncture, acupressure, surprisingly because we think we rediscovered it when Nixon visited China but it was in all the textbooks. There was always a great deal of interest in oriental medicine, so that's why we have a 18th century acupuncture figure and needles from various parts of the Orient. While the jury is still out on what it can do and how effective it is, the 18th century understanding of acupuncture is the same as today. 
The theory is that there is a kind of energy called chi, ki in Japanese, prana in uh, Sanskrit, and it's a vital energy that is, is in all of us and in everything, and through the meridian system we can manipulate that in a particular way. But even the Western medicine of earlier times was plagued with questionable ideas. This self-enema device comes from the mid-1800s, representing a practice still done today, but not sanctioned by most physicians. This device was a lobotomy tool. Lobotomies actually earned uh, Dr. Egash Monnier a Nobel Prize because it was a way of relieving mental symptoms that nothing else could touch. And they found that by destroying certain small areas of the brain, you could change the personality. So people suffering from severe mental disabilities were no longer depressed or agitated. But this dangerous technique is no longer used today. This small artifact was called a lancet, and it was used to perform bleedings at home. It was believed that bleeding a patient would restore a healthy balance of fluids to the body. It came complete with its own bleeding bowl. This is another technique now rejected by modern medicine. It was something rather like this that may have killed George Washington, who some claim was bled to death when he fell ill with a throat infection. Cupping, a variation on bleeding, was a popular cure-all 200 years ago. This kit came complete with a hand pump to bring the blood to the surface and a spring-loaded wrist slasher. A suction cup would then draw out the blood. The process of wrist cutting was mechanized with this device to make it easier and safer for the user. It employed a set of blades that were spring-loaded and released with the press of a trigger. It's ironic. A medical technique that is today considered harmful was once regarded as healthy. But because of research at places like the Mutter, medicine has advanced beyond such remedies. While a lot of them look like torture devices, these dental instruments, much like those used today, go back to the mid-19th century. And they were used with ether or nitrous oxide, the earliest use of anesthetics in medicine. Tools like this extractor made the dentist's life easier, but it was still pretty rough on the patient. This violet ray apparatus, popular around 1910, produced heating in muscles. Some claimed it could cure all kinds of disease. They were wrong, but it did have one real effect. One effect of the violet ray apparatus is that it generates ozone around the vacuum tube, and ozone is bactericidal. So barbers often used it on their clients after they had shaved them, and it would destroy the kind of bacteria that would cause uh, problems on the face. The Mutter's collection of early microscopes represents the beginning of a more enlightened era in medicine, when observation and experimentation would guide medical advancement. One of the earliest microscopes was a pinhole viewer used by Antony van Leeuwenhoek around 1670. Van Leeuwenhoek was a Dutch maintenance man at a police station. He became fascinated with the new invention and was the first to observe red blood cells, bacteria, and yeast in beer. He was also the first to use the microscope in crime detection. And his work led to the simple yet revolutionary idea that germs cause disease. While many of these old technologies seem like Jules Verne contrivances, this iron lung was a state-of-the-art lifesaver. It is used to ventilate the individual to help him breathe through positive, negative pressure that's applied on the rib cage, and it's simply the force of air pressure that, that breathes for him. And in polio and other acute respiratory problems, the, the rib cage and the muscles can be paralyzed. Some people spent the rest of their lives in it because they never recovered function. The museum's diverse collection of historic inventions and medical anomalies has inspired research and led to cures for many forms of illness. But what sets the Mutter's exhibits apart from most others is the display of medical conditions that science has yet to conquer. Somewhere. 
As the Greek god of health, Aesculapius lords over the College of Physicians. He is emblematic of human perfection. He is a reminder of that elusive ideal that is relentlessly pursued, though never attained. But in order for physicians to explain and expand their understanding of this ideal, they have had to confront the darker side of the human form, like this cornucutaneum, or skin horn. Other conditions were what doctors called monstrous births. The use of the term monster really relates more to the fact that it's a monstrous, a large defect, as opposed to a minor defect. Some of them are the result of outside agents, like this leg cast of an elephantiasis victim caused by the filaria worm in the lymph system. Others are examples of cancerous tumors left untreated. These fetal skeletons illustrate the normal stages of prenatal development and serve as a contrast to those with congenital abnormalities. We also have a fairly large collection of conjoined twins showing the various ways you can be conjoined from having a single head and two bodies or having uh, two heads and a single body. These specimens are of great value to medical students who might never see such examples in a modern teaching hospital. These dicephalic twins, born in Ohio in 1870, shared a single umbilical cord, and like the Siamese twins, had different temperaments during their brief lives. Likewise, these cephalothoracopagus twins, born in 1851, did not long survive their birth. Most victims of such deformities don't. Abnormal growths, like this one where the brain grew outside the skull, show the myriad of forms that birth defects might take. Other abnormalities weren't immediately life-threatening, but they were extremely rare. This human colon weighs 47 pounds. It's a form of Hirschsprung's disease, a problem with the nerve supply to the colon's muscle walls. It belonged to a 29-year-old man who spent a decade in a Philadelphia museum presenting himself as the balloon man. He was five and a half foot tall, but his colon exceeds seven feet. It may not be surprising that just before his death, he consulted a doctor complaining of constipation. Human extremes of every kind are here. The skeletons of a male giant, a dwarf woman, and a normal body are on hand for comparison. The dwarf woman, three and a half feet high, is accompanied by the skull of her child, who had to be delivered by caesarean section. The giant, by contrast, is seven foot six inches. It's an example of what growth hormones can do when the endocrine system malfunctions. The rib cage is misshapen because the man's extraordinary size and weight caused a deformation in the skeletal structure, a common side effect of such runaway growth. The museum not only demonstrates the strange things nature does to the body, it also displays the results of what man can do to himself. The practice of foot binding, once considered stylish in China, is shown by this model and by an actual bound foot to have crippling results. Other exhibits are of man-made deformities inflicted in the heat of battle. We have a collection of casualties from World War I. They came from base hospital number 10, which was in uh, Le Treport, France, showing the effects of different types of shrapnel and bullets on the bones of the uh, individuals. But perhaps the strangest examples of man's alteration of himself are the shrunken heads created by the Hivero tribes in the mountains of Ecuador and Peru. We have two shrunken heads in our collection. One is a genuine Hivero Tsansa from Ecuador, which means that the Indians there, the Hivero Indians, prepared it as part of their religious rituals. The other one is one that we suspect was made for the tourist trade. It's a true shrunken head but the attempt to make it look in proportion by cutting the hair, by leaving the hair on the face, this is not typical of 
the way the Hebrews prepare their skulls. The reason for head shrinking was that the Hivaro believed the soul is in the head. By shrinking and sewing up the head of an enemy, the soul is trapped, preventing it from joining its kinsmen in the afterlife. The head shrinking procedure is very precise. A victim's flesh would be cut along the back and peeled off the skull. The skin would be immersed in hot water until it shrank to two-thirds its normal size. The eyes and lips were then sewn shut, and hot stones or sand were poured into the head cavity to shrink it further. Finally, it was smoked over a fire to preserve it. It could take 30 hours to complete the process. These specimens are a vivid documentation of the Hivero's understanding of the body and of the world. How are we gonna do this, Jorge? Of the weird and wonderful. Like the Mutter, the Condon Medical Museum in Bangkok, Thailand is also aimed primarily at medical students, though the general public also finds it fascinating. The exhibits at the Condon Museum evoke varied reactions. And it's also generated controversy. Displays like these cross sections, preserved in clear acrylic, allow medical students on field trips to examine the intricacies of the brain structure in an almost living condition. Here, a human nervous system has been painstakingly teased out of a body so it can be studied in isolation. These are actual nerve fibers, not replications. An organic parallel to the Mutter's phantom brain. The Condon also has cadavers carefully dissected, with sections peeled back to reveal tissue layers with a level of detail far exceeding any textbook. Museums that preserve maladies of the past to serve the doctors of the future are what the Mutter helped to inaugurate. And this educational tradition continues today with exhibits like Harry, an example of a rare condition in which soft connective tissue turns to bone, immobilizing the victim. What makes him important is that currently there is some breakthrough research being done at the University of Pennsylvania and elsewhere that is focusing on the cause and the possible cure of this disease. And Harry is the best documented skeleton with this disorder in the world. Understanding disease. This is what the Mutter Museum and its vivid array of exhibits is all about. As new displays are added, the museum continues its role as an educational tool for medical students, medical historians, and the general public. In the 21st century, we take for granted that medical science can tackle and eventually conquer every threat to human health and long life. That optimism has been enshrined in the Mutter Museum from its humble beginnings. The belief that medicine is always a work in progress and the Mutter's importance to medical research continues to grow as it has throughout its history. When it first was organized, it was probably the least important of the medical museums in this country. What is interesting is that we're still here, whereas many of the university medical museums have long since been disbanded and put in storage because they cease to be relevant to the needs of the current medical students. There is no good substitute for the real thing, and the Mutter is a museum of the real thing.